Hey everybody, welcome to DEF CON 864. My name is Ben, I go by Overcast on Discord. It is awesome to see so many of you here with us tonight. So we do have a few rules, code of conduct that we follow. In essence, these boil down to just being a good human. Nothing surprising, hopefully. We'll all be kind to one another. This is a very small information security community here in the upstate of South Carolina. We want that to grow, and we are all actively involved in helping each one of us grow in that area. So thank you for being here, and let's, let's do this well. Uh, a couple things. If you do have certifications that require, like, continuing education or things like the, the CPEs that you submit, you can take credit for these meetings by submitting those CPEs. Usually I think it's, like, one or two per meeting that we have. If you speak at the meeting, like uh, Drew's going to do tonight, you can rack up a whole lot more. Uh, points for that. In fact, when Eric and I did ours last year, it took no time at all to liquidate that supply. I actually can't stand doing CPEs. It's like, you went through all the training to take the cert. No, now you spend the rest of your life maintaining that. All right, next slide. Thank you. So a few things. If you're interested in what's coming to DEF CON 864, we publish and keep this up to date. Our schedule, our speaker schedule for the entire year, as far out as we can project it. Right now, I think we're projecting speaker, speakers all the way through December of this year. I'm waiting on some feedback from two individuals, and then we will have a very well-known name in the information security community at large across the nation speaking in a couple months uh, next year, or next month. Next month in March, we're actually going to have we're going to have a special guest speaker named Chris Furtick, who's going to be speaking on growing your career with AI. Uh, so that should be really interesting. It's going to be held down at uh, Anderson University in the library there. Thank you, Kurt, for helping set that up. We're looking forward to that. Directions, address will all be posted online. If you're not able to make that journey or that drive, fear not. We do stream like we're doing right now on Discord. So if you're going to be remote, that's cool. Otherwise, I'll see you down there in Anderson. Uh, DEF CON 31 has already been scheduled. It's on the books right now for August 10th through the 13th. For the, so for those of you who do have a training budget, make your plans to go. They, they've released this, this slide to uh, indicate what the uh, topic's going to be about. So it's uh, the future will prevail. There are a few other conferences in the local area that we track. There are a few that have posted dates already. I already mentioned uh, DEF, CON, DEF CON 31 that's coming up. Besides Augusta has actually released that October 7th will be there. Uh, B-Sides event. This is a don't miss event. It's like 30 bucks. We get road trips together for those of us that are in the group and ride down there. We always grab dinner or something afterwards sometimes. So. Sometimes before. Sometimes before, sometimes during. It's an awesome time to network. It's an awesome time to net network. So we'll keep these up to date. Each month you'll see new dates pop up as those are scheduled and appear. And then tonight we have a presentation by the one and only, the ever-reclining Andrew. Sure. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, sir. A description of my career. All right, guys. Um, you know, as Ben said, I'm Andrew. Um, so today I just wanted to talk to everyone just a little bit about essentially how to get noticed in cybersecurity, especially the earlier career guys. I know a lot of us have kind of struggled. You, you put out applications and there's nothing. And then I'll end up like signing online and I'll see a lot of people talking about this. So I kind of took those frustrations that like when I go on Reddit or go on Discord and see people talking about not getting noticed. And I just wanted to kind of provide my path on how it's worked out thus far in the past two years. Perfect. All right, we're back. Awesome. So just a quick overview. Uh, I essentially put my disclaimer in here. I don't want to pretend as if I'm some kind of expert. I'm not. I'm early career in cybersecurity. Um, and I've just been pretty lucky thus far. There's been application processes that have worked out really well. And so that I just want to kind of share how that's been. So uh, just a little bit about me. I was in four years sales management, five distribution, yada, yada. I did do three and a half years in the recruiting industry, which is why I wanted to give uh, this topic today. I actually worked with Drew Greenwood, who's in the uh, way, who's in the room right now. Common mistake. Um, like wood all the time. But yeah, I mean, they call me James Andrew. Uh, and now I'm working in cybersecurity in a program management in a kind of a GRC capacity. Um, and so the reason I'm here is kind of the same thing I said. Right now there's a pretty big talent gap in uh, cybersecurity. I think we're all acutely aware of it. Um, according to ISC squared, last year it was three and a half million uh, individuals roughly. 
that gap has actually widened 26% year on year. Yet, just like I brought up a few minutes ago, you sign on Twitter, you go on Reddit, and people are talking about cybersecurity careers, especially early and junior people, and they can't get any rec like any application process they're going through. And the funny thing about it is I don't really apply to jobs, and that's essentially what I came here to say. Like I've, I don't think I've ever gotten a job that I've applied for. I think it's you're leaving your luck to someone else. And so, uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just skip the joke. Take this from what it's worth. So the first problem that I've noticed in kind of, I think we've all seen this when we're on LinkedIn, is the qualifications for jobs are kind of hilarious. I literally typed in cybersecurity entry level. The first thing that popped up was this one. And it was a, it was a part-time job. And it was three and a half, they wanted three years of cybersecurity uh, experience, experience in DOD risk management, ability to manage multiple ATO requests simultaneously. They wanted a clearance, and it said 75K. And I was just like, that's hilarious. But, and then this one was even more ridiculous. This wasn't the part-time one. This was just contract work, and this is what they put for experience. And they didn't put or anywhere. It'd be nice to have. So I feel like what we run into a lot is people will be like, I don't know, I feel like people stare at these requirements for way too long, like from an applicant standpoint. I, I'll talk to people again, you know, going back to when I'm having these conversations with other people who are junior and mid, and they're like, ah, oh, you know, I looked at it and I just don't think I fit that. It's like, yeah, I don't think whoever wrote this is going to find anyone. Like, so just apply. That's why, really, just don't let the perfection be the enemy of progress on this. Like, apply for those jobs when you see them. Uh, it's really annoying how poorly written they were in the first place. Um, so here's a fun fact, uh, and Drew can attest to it. Recruiters are tools, so are you. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because you're just a tool to them as a means to an end, and they're just a tool for, to you as a means to an end. That doesn't mean that it's bad. Nothing, no one's inherently bad in this. But I think what's often misconceived, uh, and I know this from my time as a recruiter, is people will call you, candidates will call you, and they'll just be tearing you a new one for not having gotten them a job yet or anything. Recruiters don't work for you. They work for the client company. Whether it be an external recruiter or not, uh, they work for whoever the client is, and that's the company. Whoever's writing the checks is who they work for. And so people need to understand that if they're going to work with a recruiter. I've seen so many people just shoot themselves in the foot just because they let that relationship go awry when really it's just be a professional. Uh, another real fact is their compensation model doesn't really incentivize them to push negotiation in your favor. And I'm going to add a caveat to that in a minute because it's not a fair statement without contextualizing it. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is they're going to be more likely to push job order at a client company on to you if they like you. And they also have very little ability to push the final decision in your favor, but a pretty strong ability to push the final decision against you. And I say that because if you let that relationship go awry, what's going to end up happening is they could question, you know, maybe you let it go awry because, I don't know, you started changing the requirements you set in the first place. They're going to let the company know, like, hey, I'm getting weird vibes from them. You might want to just move on. And that's going to be listened to. But if he calls and say, hey, you know, Andrew's a really great candidate. You're going to want it. The hiring manager knows he's incentivized to say that. So you really just want to curate that relationship well and also just make sure you're working well with recruiters. And that's why I want to give uh, kind of candidate tips on that front. Be honest and upfront, easy to work with, because those kind of candidates, they're going to continue to get those callbacks and they're going to be continually on everyone's kind of top of mind. You know, if a job order comes in that kind of fits your background, they're going to say, all right, well, you know, I talked to Andrew, you know, a few days ago. He's pretty consistent. He's a good guy. Like, he might fit 70% of this job, but that's usually good enough. Uh, be honest about your total compensation needs, income, PTO, insurance, and other benefits. Um, and represent yourself to the client company in the same way uh, that you're representing yourself to the recruiter. And I kind of pair those both together, and it kind of goes back to the compensation models topic. If you end up letting, like, if you end up changing your mind on compensation, 
but you didn't give the whole picture of why, they're going to end up just thinking that you're kind of playing games with them. And it kind of goes back to they have very little ability to push you on a company, but a lot of ability to take you away. And they probably will do that because it seems like you're a flaky candidate at this point. Now, all that's to say, I don't really, like, if we're talking about juniors and entry level, recruiters are probably a really bad time spend for you anyways. Like, they need, they need to make money on people that they can actually sell to a company. You know, they're probably getting 25% of that person's first year salary. So a lot of the times it's not going to be people without experience. And, like, that's something I experienced a lot as a recruiter, that people who were just fresh out of college would get really frustrated and I was like, you're not spending your time in the right spot. Um, so I just wanted to kind of quickly walk through the recruiter compensation model, which is, this is fairly typical. I'm sure Drew could say, ah, you know, there's uh, differences with my company. I, I kind of brought up a former company that I worked with and this is kind of typical of their model, but so 30% of all their billings above about 13 and a half K, that's essentially what they owe to the company for their salary. Uh, go to 30% of all billings of the month. 30% of all collected money goes to their billings for the month. That number changes 40% if you're above 180 K, resets, but yada, yada. Billings are essentially calculated 25% of a candidate's first year salary as presented in the offer is about an average fee. 50% of that could go to the recruiter, 50% to an account manager, whoever manages that client company. Sometimes that could be the same person depending on how that firm works. But all that's to say, like if you look at an example uh, job order then, say it's a 125 to 150K analyst, uh, total fee is gonna be like 31 to 38K. The fact of the matter is, if you really look how that breaks down, this is why I'm saying you want to be very precise with your negotiate or with your compensation needs with them because they aren't going to want to really change the number post fact. If you're midway through a process and you're like, you know, I thought about it and I want more money, that just doesn't work for them. It ends up making them look really bad at the company and either they're going to lose that relationship with the company if they go fight that or you're going to lose that relationship with that recruiter and they're probably never going to work with you again. And because the fact that for them, they know if they try to do that, they're going to either look snaky or it's going to drag out the process in which they're going to lose the ability to fill that job anyways. And I just say that to really look at what you need from a compensation standpoint before you engage with recruiters and just understand. Because it, you know, if, if you talk to them about PTO and total compensation in terms of benefits and any kind of uh, insurance and any kind of other fringe benefits, then you have a leg to stand on when you're saying, hey, I looked at their benefits package. I need more money. Uh, and that kind of gives them the ability to continue to work with you because you're not being dishonest you're just, and you're not changing your mind. You're just essentially saying, hey, you know, I, the total comp doesn't add up. So I say all that because I just want everyone to not really rely on recruiters as well and not rely on applications as well. Because the reality is, like, you're going to make all of your best job moves in your career on the basis of knowing people. You're either the people you've worked with or people that you connect with. And that's essentially how I've been able to do this thus far. And so I just wanted to, I kind of joked with the might hire attack framework, so kind of stolen from uh, MITRE here. But all of it is essentially, if you're gonna, you should just research the heck out of companies or people that you're talking to and make sure that you're creating genuine connections. So like even resource development, I was like, reach out genuinely. You don't have to be weird or snaky or anything about it. Like I'll, the way, I'll show you how I end up doing it in a second, but like just create relationships. So this entire chart right here is kind of just a joke. It's just to say, you know, uh, look at the company, create these relationships, reach out. This is kind of the key one, defense evasion, which um, is a joke. Just stay out of HR's way, and that's an application. If, if you're just saying, oh, you know, I applied to 100 companies, you're probably going to be frustrated at the end of it, and there's a good chance that you didn't really look at your 
resume to say, okay, does this fit this job or am I changing it just a little bit to fit how they're phrasing these things? Like I, I still want everyone to be honest with the applications they're putting out, but really curating it. So if you're sending 100 applications, I'd say please don't. I'd rather you go meet five people on LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm early career. Like, please help me out. And so that's kind of what this next slide is. I got two interviews based on just these two reach outs. And I can read it later or just share this, but essentially it's just saying, hey, like, this is who I am. I'm in a career pivot. I see what your careers look like. I can't offer you anything, but I would love a chance to lean on you. And both of those hiring managers said, I have an opening. And so, and I didn't get either of those jobs, but both of them still keep in contact with me. And that's why I would like highly recommend if you're gonna spend your time anywhere, especially if you're entry level, spend it on meeting people. Coming to something like this is a great starting point. There is a lot of experience in this room and a lot of people who can help you out. Um, even the other day I was talking to another individual here and after hearing his needs, I was like, you know what, I actually know someone. And I was able to send uh, another DCA64 member to a essentially head of InfoSec at a major corporation that responded to me and was like, oh yeah, help other people out. Like that's gonna help you out. Like the person that I was helping out, I could have never got the role that they were after, but now I can tell just based on my conversation with the hiring manager, he's now in their process. So pretty standard chart. I just wanted to present it and say, this is what especially like er early career people need to be considering this when they're spending their time getting frustrated at interview processes. Spend your time on high impact and low effort activities, or at the very least high impact, high effort. And so I kind of break that down to like high impact, low effort, is going to be pursuing a lead through mutual connections, interviews, networking, updating your resume before sharing it to accurately reflect the language and skills desired of the job industry that you're uh, going after. You know, low impact, low effort, it's gonna be seeing a job advertisement of interest and making a concerted effort to keep con connect with people in that organization. That might not work out. A lot of the times if you're reaching out to people with a specific job in mind, now it seems like an ask, you seem salesy. But usually, like, I'll just see an organization I want to look, work for, and I'm like, or someone that I know could like, potentially help me out, and be like, hey, this is who I am. I know you could help me out. I'm in my career, early career. I don't think I can do anything for you, but like, I would love to steal a few minutes of your time. And usually people, especially in this industry, are really cool. I mean, this entire presentation works for anyone in any industry. But I think cybersecurity or technology is really unique in the sense that People genuinely want to help. If you're in accounting and you're like, hey, I want a mentor, the senior accountant, Vic, you're weird, bro. It's like, we all know how to do this job. Like, you know, just spend your time. But InfoSec is pretty interesting in the sense that, you know, everyone I run into, like, this group is a great example. Everyone's trying to help each other. And so, like, spend your time trying to create those connections, and the jobs will take care of themselves. And the time to create those connections is not when you're ready to leave your job. If you're ready to leave your job and you're just done, you're probably going to still spend some time. Like, all of it takes time, but one of it is less annoying. Like, would you rather apply or would you rather create those connections online anyways? Um, so, actually, that's it. That was pretty short. So, any questions? But... One thing I actually did want to bring up, and I totally forgot during it, is now that Drew's here, I want to say, like, give an example of a bad candidate interaction, that just someone who shot themselves in the foot. Because those are like, I always found those so interesting, because it's like, you could have had that job, but you just right. blew it. So I'm glad you told me to think of one before, but it probably wouldn't have taken that long, because it's actually very recent. Um, we had a guy, he was a knowledge manager for a company. Um, it was a JIRA administrator opening one of our clients, and he had apparently worked in JIRA day in and day out, although his primary position was knowledge manager. I was like, okay, that can kind of work, because we don't need too much experience, but having that could work, and he's a very sharp guy, so I was like, I, I think he could fit into this company, and we're confirmed, hey, so you want to work in JIRA, this is what you want to do with your career, like get into JIRA, like, oh yeah, I didn't even know there's positions for it, and now that I've been working in it, it's going to be perfect for me, 
so we lined up the interview and told the client, I was like, this guy, like, he does use Jira. I think he could really fit into this role. He's also very sharp, so I think you guys could utilize him elsewhere. Of course, he gets into the interview, and he tells them he wants nothing to do with Jira. And he just wanted to interview with them to see what other opportunities there were within. And the client tells us that. We have a great relationship with them. And I was like, I am so sorry. I was like, you can ask myself. You can ask our recruiter that was working with him. He said this to the T. And um, he was like, I, I believe you. He was like, we'll just forget about that one. But needless to say, we're probably not going to work with that guy anymore. And we told him why and what he had told us and how it conflicted with what he told the client. And he, of course, was frustrated with us because, you know, it, it didn't work out for him. Um, but I think in the end, he, he knew he was in the wrong. So um, to what Andrew was saying, be very transparent on what your interests are, what your goals are for looking, what your goals are for a new position. Um, be transparent with the recruiter and be as tra transparent with the client as well during the interview so there's no conflicts in the uh, message. Perfect. Any questions? Anyone? It's a very technical topic today. <laughs> One question. Okay. If you like get in an interview and you feel like the recruiter didn't quite understand your background, is there a way in the interview to like rectify that? I feel like if it's something honest like that, like I mean yeah, the recruiter might get frustrated, but you're probably dealing with someone junior. I think I've been in that position before where I was like convinced that someone is a fit and sent them on to a uh, client company and gave them some kind of context then the client called me back and like what the heck are you thinking I mean you just deal with that if I mean that's on them still as long as it is on them you know as long as it doesn't represent any kind of contradiction to what you guys have previously spoken about I say why not again everything was just aimed at be as honest if you're going to work with recruiters be as honest and upfront as possible Otherwise, you're going to sour that relationship either with them or for them with that company. And you're just going to lose that ability. And that's the whole thing. Like, you can't negotiate once you've been dishonest or misrepresented yourself because they don't want to. They'd rather collect the 33K check for the company at that point and then be done with it as opposed to the 35K check because they got an extra, you know, 10 grand out of it. Question for you. You have a hundred candidate. He's working with multiple different recruiting firms. Is he shooting himself in the foot? I appreciate that because I actually forgot to step on that. But there was something in there that said be organized in your search. And yeah, that's really annoying. Not only is he shooting himself in the foot. I mean, maybe Drew, you've been in longer than I have at this point. But like, you just end up looking. The recruiter ends up looking real dumb because like, didn't you talk to this guy? Haven't you? Hasn't he said that either? You know company X sent them over or that he's already applied for this role so that's why so you can't always tell the candidate where you're sending them which is frustrating I get for the candidate sometimes it's confidential shirt search especially at the level of you know kind of an executive so if you're a manager or above sometimes that search is confidential because it might be a replacement or a backfill of someone who's currently in that seat uh, and so that person's probably, you know, getting fired and it can't be out there that that rolls open. And so it, that's when it becomes a little bit more challenging. But in reality, if they, they should always know where their resume is. Like when I'm applying, I always know where my resume is and who at least I've given it to from a recruiter standpoint. Uh, and then I ask them back, like if they say, hey, I'm sending you to someone, I'll be like, who is it? If they can tell me or they can't tell me. Some, if they can't tell me, I'm like, cool. If they can't tell me, that's fine too, but that might run into... If they can't tell you, you probably haven't seen that job opening anyways. But, Drew, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, I, would, I would disagree with what you said 100%. And I think it can be, it can be helpful to leverage all the recruiters that you can, right? I mean, leverage the ones that you want to have the relationships with that you see value in. Um, if it's multiple, that's great, but... Like Andrew said, be organized in that, and just don't shoot yourself in the foot. Don't lie to somebody and say, oh, no, I haven't been submitted there um, when you have, or no, I didn't apply there internally when you have. You know, know exactly where your resume is going so you don't look dumb, like you said, and then the recruiter doesn't look dumb. Because so. all we're going to do, or, you know, in that previous life, all I would do is I might even share that communication with the company and be like, look, they told me they have it. 
So now you look dumb as a candidate because it's either I look dumb or you look dumb, and I'm going to make damn sure you look dumb because I, I don't want to own that. But. How do you All right. Uh, can I ask a question? Yep. Uh, I always feel like I do terrible at interviewing. I, like I, I can talk to people, but it's like just something, some weird disconnect, something doesn't get communicated right. Like, I can physically do the job, but it's like, by people see it as a problem in convincing people to hire me. So, I mean, you know, the one thing I'd say to that is something like creating genuine connection beforehand and not relying on application process would serve you well. And I know it's, it's scarier for someone who's like, you know, potentially introverted. But if you don't think you do well in an interview, but you do well in a conversation, have conversations. But you only get a 30 minute interview, you know, or whatever. Practice. All right, thank you. How do you move compensation conversations earlier in the process? Because I find sometimes I look at a job, it looks interesting, it looks like something I might be interested in, but their their compensation range is huge, and depending on what you know, kind of experience and that type of thing. So it could be either way under anything I consider, so let's just move on, or it could be something I'm interested in, but. The problem is, is usually it's like you got to do a few rounds of interviews before you even get that conversation. So now you've wasted my time, you've wasted their time, only to find out that they weren't even really looking to pay what you were looking to, to get. Yeah. Is there a way to, to get at the numbers without, you know, because it seems like they're trying to keep that so secretive. <laughs> I would say even end of first interaction is fine. Okay. Uh, you know, be, and I say end because it's like be – be a good candidate in the sense that, like, and so this is whether you're talking, obviously, if you're talking to an external recruiter, you guys are talking numbers. But if you're talking to either an internal recruiter or hiring manager, and you're at the end of the interview, and they're like, you know, anything else? I think that's the time. Like, have a few genuine questions about the company. Hmm. Show your interest. Show that you have those skills. But, like, then actually, I would get into it. And I would just call a spade a spade. I would say, hey. You know, I am looking here. Uh, I'm genuinely interested. It sounds like, you know, we might have that going, but I just want to make sure that, like, the range that you guys are looking at is, you know, what I'm looking for. Hmm. So, like, I see this big salary band or I see no salary band. Can we have that conversation? I'll usually just kind of ask for permission. Like, do you mind? Because, like, I know it's, you know, supposedly taboo, but I one thing I've noticed in companies that I've either – had interviews with myself or organizations that I've sent candidates to, the companies that are more awkward in the beginning about that are usually companies I don't want to work for anyways. So I don't know if that. Yeah, uh, that's uh, appreciated. Ted? How do you balance getting answers to questions, whether it's about compensation or schedule or any of those things that will affect your work and personal life without looking too needy. Yeah, no, no, and I think that's good. I think it's kind of a continuation, but a good continuation of the last question in the sense that, like, I don't think it's bad to ask those questions. I just think it's bad to lead with those questions. And obviously there's balance. If you have a 50-minute interview and the last 15, are you figuring the logistics of does the money work for me and does the way this is organized work for me? I think they might see you as needy, but I think it's just about asking them maybe in advance like you're saying like work-life balance and all that you can ask some of those questions you know without even asking that question you know what's a typical day look like here cool like early career you know what what are your expectations for me three six nine months in and you'll start to be able to aggregate all that and say this is going to be hell or these guys are pretty cool anyone else yes sir uh, how does the like the salary that you accept early on in your career and affect you later down the line in terms of maybe like future roles and your ability to negotiate like, in the future? I mean, I I, I guess that, that to me that only affects you internally, like, and I think it does, and that's the crappy situation, and that's why you'll have employers saying like, oh man, no one has any loyalty anymore. And it's like I can get a twenty percent jump, or I can continue to complain here and get my 
four and a half percent rate. It's like th this doesn't make sense. But I would say it's none of their business. And honestly, if there's one thing I'm fine with anyone lying about, it's anyone asking you your salary to base off of what they're going to offer. Say whatever. You know, uh, I'm in this range, or my expectation due to the job I'm in is this range. So you didn't even say what you're at. You just said my expectation due to, you know, my experience. I would just try to answer that with kind of a half truth. And I'm not advocating for lying. And I'm not saying like, oh, I'm, but like, they no matter what your value and what you're being paid have nothing to do with one another except what you're willing to accept. Like that's when, but like if your value as a candidate, like you, you have you know, five, ten years of experience and you have a pretty progressive career and experience with these tool sets and they're offering you like 70K, well, then it's just like you're not matching my value. My market value is X. Like, And you can look at that up. I mean, uh, Drew, I don't know if your organization has anything like the salary guide that Robert Half has, but I would definitely, I should have even shared it. Like, Robert Half salary guides are pretty great especially if you're a candidate locally, because they are a little inflated, I will say, locally. Like, I've, they're a little above market, even though it says it's not, and it has the whole, neg you know, minus 5% adjustment. Their salary guide is a good measure of, okay, I'm a junior X. And, you know, so for Robert Half, it kind of sucks, because you only have so many job roles. You have some accounting, HR, you do have tech, though, so if you're in tech, it is there, but you can kind of calculate. Oh, this is what the market would pay me. Thank you. And I would rely on that data. I'd throw, if they're being jerks about it, and you know you're not gonna get the job because of that, or you're not gonna take it, I would be like, hey, like, this is your problem. I mean, obviously, in a nice way that you keep that bridge alive and well. But I would just be like, this is what I'm referring to. You know? Well, you're gonna be better off having been honest with them because you're going to be more likely to enjoy at least or you know endure the the job you're in if you were at least honest going into it than if you were trying to hedge your bets thinking hey maybe it'll turn out yeah you, you know and having worked with a lot of different people down through the years the you know you personally get through the job even if it's a tough job or a yeah. bad situation if you at least were honest with yourself going into that process. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good point. Not only being honest with them, but being honest with yourself. Like, am I going to take this? You know, I've accept, I have accepted the first role I got in InfoSec, which really wasn't even what it was claimed to be, but at a third of what I was making previously, just so I could get in, uh, and, you know, that was a calculated risk with my wife and I. But within six months, I was like, I was never honest with myself. I was never going to accept this. Like, and so I got out. Was LinkedIn your main networking source? Or were there any alternative sources that you leverage? I mean, I think LinkedIn and, I mean, uh, the, like, obviously this group. And there's like good other tech groups locally. Like I like tech after five. I'm not trying to advocate for another group. Good it's, point. but it's, uh, you know, I, I like what they do. And I, I went there. I've gone to the CSA events. I like those. But yeah, I'd say this and LinkedIn are probably my number one. And this is more fun than anything. But it's been a very valuable source. Secondarily, like it's just been like, oh, this is fun. But wow, I met this guy, and you know. It just ends up being uh, pretty helpful. But LinkedIn is powerful in that sense. Like, I absolutely, I don't know. I, I probably spent too much time on it. I, I felt like even when I left uh, Robert Half, I opened LinkedIn every workday. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, what am I doing? But I ended up being like, wow, well, that guy has a cool background. I'm so interested in it. I'm just going to talk to him. And I've talked to so many people who are like, I'm never going to hire you. Like, just because they're, you know, they're in X position or I don't even have that kind of background. Like, a head of red teaming for Capital One, it's like, you're never going to hire me. But it was cool that we had that conversation. We talked to the deputy CISO for Google one time. It's cool that we have that conversation. Like, but everyone in InfoSec is so willing to help if you approach them genuinely. That's why, like, I mean, I'll even go back to it. 
I usually lead with, let me preface, this is not a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I like yeah. that a lot. Because so many people, like, I mean, if you're in any role every day, it's like, oh, my God, we have a new sock solution. It's like, leave me alone. Like, I appreciate what you're doing, but please leave me alone. Eventually, it inverts and it's job offers. But anyways, that's for much better advice. Go to the previously referenced. Uh, that's a good plug. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I appreciate everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, is everyone online? Anyone else? There are. I haven't seen any other questions. Cool. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start talking about projects. I can share an update on a project that I've been working on. It's something that I released over a year ago at B-Sides Greenville and then got working this year. <laughs> so I have a bad habit of speaking at B-Sides Greenville with live code. That works when you, when you run it on your, your, your system, but then when you ask other people to run it on their systems, it mileage varies greatly. So I've just finished like two months worth of refactoring on a tool I wrote called Auto Report. And it's designed to help you do like either pen testing or CTFs, capture the flag events. Uh, and I've been, I used it during my offensive security wireless professional exam to help write the report. And then at the end, you basically just type in auto report finalize and it does all the final PDF creation, seven zip creation, MD5 hashes, and just gets everything closed up for you ready to submit. So that's good to go. I just wish I could get some of the dependencies down because Pandoc is massive. It's like a 1.6 gig requirement dependency. But if you use some of the other tools that are with it, you have to get that anyway. So I don't feel too far out of band. But anyway, I'll share more about that in a little while. I think we're going to do the demo at some point. We will. Depends off if a speaker falls like through. Is you do that because you wrote it? Because I feel like they're so like nitpicky about the tools you bring in. They are, so the, I've spent a lot of time with the requirements and in their Discord, and as long as the tool isn't doing ac any of the actual offensive activities, you're good. So okay. because my tool sits, it basically, when you run it, it creates a working directory for whatever you're doing. So if you're doing like a hack the box and you pick the, the host, it creates a targets file that you can then use in Nmap, but it doesn't run Nmap for you. It correlates, it, and now it creates a chart of all the vulnerabilities you've logged and injects that into your PDF report on final, That's pretty cool. yeah, and it's ASCII chart, which I think I'm geeking out over a little bit better, but more so. But yeah, that huge consideration. But if you're working on a project, come on up, share it with us, and uh, go from there. There's no mud update this month. I didn't do any coding. So I if I'd done that, we would have canceled the meeting. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Next month, I'll have a mud update. But I, I kind of took it tech break. Now, do you still have the internship job uh, We did open? kind of close that out. I mean, if there's anyone that is interested, they, uh, if folks are interested in working on the mud, I mean, you can talk to me directly. I can. You know, I know people. Uh, I'm one of those people, so I can certainly uh, open up some doors. Are you claiming um, to know yourself? <laughs> in the third-person perspective, yeah, out of body experience, yeah, okay. you know, there's been some time in Vegas that Topic. Yep. Uh, unofficially. Shh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> it's not good. It might not be related to Epcon, might not. Uh, but general audience, since you got me talking about multi user dungeon, basically like uh, the predecessor to massive multiplayer online games, but it's all text based. Um, I think at one point, random statistic, which most of them are made up anyway, but at one point, mud traffic made up 12% of all the internet traffic that was run, running over it. So there was a lot of people playing you know, text-based adventure games online with each other somewhere around 1992 or 1993. Um, we've been online since 1993, and I've been heading up a project to refactor the code to make it more like Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 or Pathfinder as a rule-based system, like a D20 system, instead of the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons or DD 2.0. A lot of work. Usually my updates are more like yeah. in-game type stuff, you know, like the new stuff you can do. It's pretty cool. Yeah, your blog post on what is randomization, what is true randomization, and then working through the code set. Yeah, fascinating. Good blog post. Absolutely I, fascinating. And still going to do a, a part two to that when I tie it all together in-game. But it, our players always complained. They always felt like the 
loop system was broke. You know, they were like, oh, your random number generator is trash. You know, we killed that boss mob 50 times. So I geeked out and I wrote about how I analyzed the algorithm the game uses and two other alternatives that it could use and walk through the whole process. Guess what? <laughs> Where's that blog post? Uh, so it's a little, if you go into dc864.org, I think it's, you can either look at posts for me, which there's only like two or three, yeah. but it's called Playing with Numbers in the Mud. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even sharing off of that screen. But. But there's going to be a part two, since that one was all like theoretical. Part two, there's now going to be things to update code live logs, so as you kill a creature in the game, all the things that could drop those logs or rolls are collected so we can do real analysis and next to real time for zero dollars. Yep. Because we don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, anyone else, just go ahead and come on up. Give it a couple minutes and if nobody does, that's fine. So that's a good point. So here's the thing. It doesn't have to be a crazy project that you're cutting edge technology on, right? It has to be something that's interesting to you. It can, it can even be just life. It doesn't have to be technology intersecting life. And so we're all learning and growing, right? Andrew, or Andrew, Eric was like focusing on randomization there for a while. So if you're in a school project and something's grabbed your eye, yeah, come on up and share it with us. Hacking your diet, changing your routine. Question. Yeah. Sorry, am I interrupting someone? Nope. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I've been in HTML and CSS class, and I am bored to death, but the only thing that slightly interested me was thinking about, like, security regarding, like, can CSS scripting be used in terms of, like, cyber attacks? Uh, you can... Fishing. Yeah, phishing. You can make something look like something that's not. Okay, and that's just cross-site script, but that's more on like HTML-based attacks. Uh, right. Yeah. Server-side coding. Yeah, cross-site scripting relates more to JavaScript, to being able to execute okay. things on a client machine. Okay. Yeah, I guess. I was trying to find a way to make the class at least something interesting. With CSS, you can make it pretty, though. Yeah. <laughs> but you can, you can hide things like you could hide a login, and if their password manager fills it in, maybe you can grab it out, grab their password out, or something with the cross site scripting. So all, all the technologies are interrelated. So uh, people who are doing cross site scripting may be using certain aspects about CSS to hide things, so it's, it's, no technology is bad anymore, Great. except for Java. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I was opening up the floor for you guys, all right? I, I knew you guys were going to say anything. Just the Well, I mean, yeah, okay. Like, the only big thing I think I've done recently was last semester, um, we had a um, programming uh, programming security class where we go through we Java, or not Java, um, Python, sorry, Java is a different class for a different major, so business. Um, it's still stupid. But yeah, you have to know Java uh, in order to be a business major, I think. But yeah, it's, um, it's very bad. Um, my major, cybersecurity and analytics, requires me to take a Java class. And it's um, I'm pretty sure it's just for like data analytics, yeah. but like it's it's not fun. Um, but no, um, programming security. We all have a big like final project that we do um, at the end of the class where we build a program up and see if it like you know can actually maintain itself, you know, and not as crash. <laughs> if, if you try to do something like random to it, so I had a huge password manager that I compounded with my first project. So I could just carry it over, but it was like user-based and it um, implemented hashing, AES scripting, um, AES encrypting, just stuff like that. I think I spent about like, not like two months worth of work, but like I think about a week or two straight of just waking up and sitting at my computer and then going back to bed. <laughs>
So I'll say on the HTML, H CSS stuff, from the phishing attack point of view, they're getting much more sophisticated in it. The last attack we had just a couple days ago mm -hmm. that compromised some users. What was interesting, when you go out there and look at the HTML code, so many of the calls in the HTML code were hexadecimal calls. To You look down through the HTML and it's like mostly hexadecimal calls, bracketed, 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 and it's building through hexadecimal, these, the web, the page look to the user. And so it's, it's amazing how complex they're starting to get in these attack formats with the files they're sending. I think it was one that I saw, it's like last year or the year before, but it was uh, Morse code was used in it and they were just converting it. But it's just all, you look at the technologies you use, it's all programmatic. So you write detections that will scrape, look for patterns and look to understand. Text would be kind of easy and expected because it matches a schema. So does Morse code, but you got to think, well, did a security practitioner, did the, the blue teamer who's writing the detection code think about Morse code? And if they didn't, well, then it's probably going to get by, but eventually it's going to catch back up, and then they're going to release like a signature update or a product update, and now Morse code will get busted. So then they're going to pivot over to lull speak or yeah. anything else. So you can break it. Yeah. 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 But they're advanced. They sure. are. They are. You know, as I've always said in many years, I've been in IT. For every hour we can spend trying to find a way to stop somebody, they're going to spend 10 hours trying to find a way around it. And so you're always you're always behind the curve and always just, you know, having to try to change and update what you're doing and how you're doing it to try to keep up with it. And that being in cybersecurity is what makes the job quasi-fun. You get annoyed some days when things go bad, but it makes it... You, you don't get bored because it's not like, oh, well, I've seen this for the last 17 months, you know, okay, whatever, you know, give it a day and it'll be completely changed and you'll have something new to have to try to deal with. I, have to, I applaud all of you that are getting into it kind of, I guess, in the middle of the game or like late in the game, like switching careers over to cybersecurity. I could not do that. If I did not start this in college or like even before I got there, uh, I would not be able to pick up because it's so changing just all the time. I'll just think, oh sweet summer child. <laughs> I, I'm ready. I <laughs> Any more uh, hobbies, projects? Okay. Uh, I have something. Yeah. So I, I've seen a lot of the back to the, um, just because I've seen it recently, on the phishing with, with the not HTML file that has embedded uh, JavaScript. It looks, there's some of them that look really scary and not be scared and ugly at first, but there are, I've done some playing around with them and there are some really cool JavaScript uh, deobfuscators on GitHub that work pretty well. Um, they've been able to identify a lot. There's like this technique that we've seen a lot of called a string array mapping. So basically they have an array with a bunch of different ugly text and then it's it kind of plugs it in and, and different ways. I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out but we were able to take an email that had a pretty obfuscated um, HTML file on it or the, the JavaScript in the HTML file was pretty obfuscated and I'd run it through a deobfuscator and then kind of just plug in the rest of the variables with context clues and and um it was it was pretty cool. It worked pretty well. We were able to get the whole thing the obfuscate in like maybe forty five minutes or so. Just it's good to know that there's or it's cool that there's tools out there out there for that. Um, I encourage you to check them out if you come across any of those. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, last call. Anybody else? All right, so I know that some of you check out when we do this break. So usually our meetings are broken into like two major halves. The first half is AV issues and the presentation. And then the latter half we do projects. Then we break up into what we call villages. 
Uh, typically, we have like a lock pick village where if you want to pick a lock, you can do that. That will not be held tonight. <laughs> if you wanted to do that, enjoy networking or anything else. I have the locks. I don't have the picks. <laughs> so you can give Nick a hard time about that next time you see him. But, uh, it's just a harder challenge. It is, it's a harder challenge, right? How much strength do you want to employ on the lock? So, but we're going to have two villages running tonight. You're welcome to go to neither of them and just network and hang out and chat with other folks. Um, that's what this is mainly about anyway. So the Red Team Village is going to meet, and Russell's going to be continuing the discussion around the study group for the OSCP or the PNPT or any of those type of certification aspects. Yeah, uh, I can do an elevator pitch if you want. That'll work. All right. So You want to um, come up here? I'm leading the Red Team Village tonight, and uh, so the whole point of it is to prepare you for OSCP or PNPT or whatever other entry-level pen testing certification because we know certifications mean a lot, um, especially for entry-level positions. So uh, instead of rehashing the methodology that PNPT or OSCP teaches you, um, or even like going through hack-the-box uh, things, we're going to s start with a technique that those courses seem to skim over. So the first one we started with was pivoting, because everybody who met uh, last month, the, the ones of us, the three people I think that met, said pivoting was what we wanted to focus on, so that's what has been prepared tonight. And then as a group, we'll decide what I will be teaching for the next session, whether that's uh, like understanding payloads, understanding lateral movement in AD environments, or whatever. So that's the red team village, and then Eric's going to be leading, JTEC's going to be leading the blue team village, and you're going to be doing backdoors and breaches tonight. So if you want to do an incident response test tonight, that's the route to go. Um, let me tell you what's going to come next month. I mentioned that we're going to be meeting down at Anderson University. Uh, Chris Furtick is going to be teach, uh, speaking to us as the presenter on hacking your career using AI, how to win friends, influence people, and convey risk using chat GPT. <laughs> Very timely. In this talk, he'll explore how leveraging artificial intelligence can assist cybersecurity professionals land a new job, write reports that are meaningful, and ultimately explain risk to business leaders, probably including using AI. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Discord. And those of you down at Anderson, we'll see you next month in person.